Some call it Fun City. To others, it's Gotham, the Big Apple. It's people. It's glamour. It's excitement. It's action. It's charisma. It's New York City. It's the New York Jets. For a team that started the year as Destiny's Child, 1969 ended a decade of football, an era which began 10 years ago in the half-empty stadiums of a newly born league. While many doubted, the league survived, and in January of 1969, the New York Jets gave their league its proudest moment, and the AFL had its first world champion. But the Jets were to end this decade on a cold December day, not as Destiny's child, but rather as Destiny's bridesmaid. Football is said to be a matter of talent, a matter of pride. For the 1969 Jets, it was more. It was a matter of inches. Come on, baby, get it, get it! A season measured by inches. But the Jets began their season more as a matter of pride when they decisively answered the question as to who was the number one team in New York City. For 10-year veterans like Bill Mathis, Don Maynard, Larry Grantham, Paul Rochester, and Babe Perilli, men who had grown up with the team and the league, it was an especially satisfying 37-14 victory over the Giants. The case was now closed. New York's finest were the Jets. It was the time to begin their quest to once again be the finest in the American Football League. The Jets met and defeated Buffalo in their opening game, ending a six-year hex in Buffalo. Along the watchtower of success, victory is total effort. Total effort by Joe Namath. Injured on a pass to Pete Lamons, Namath's future indeed, the future of the team itself, was in doubt. But only for a precious few minutes. On the very next play, Namath hit Don Maynard for a touchdown. Total effort. Total effort by Jim Turner, who began his quest for another scoring crown with four field goals. Total effort by the Jets' defense that sacked the quarterback four times and dampened O.J.'s debut. Total effort by the offense and Matt Snell, who helped break open a tie game in the last quarter. And total effort by five new starters, especially Paul Crane, who iced the game 33-19 with this touchdown interception. It was only the beginning of a long and winding road ahead, but the New York Jets were on their way. After solving a six-year jinx at Buffalo, the Jets failed to beat Denver for the third time in a row. The defeat was almost overshadowed by Steve O'Neill, who made football history with the longest punt ever recorded, 98 yards. But O'Neill's punt was not enough. A two-point conversion failed late in the game, and New York lost 21 to 19. From Denver to San Diego, the Jets are said to often court disaster, then escape unharmed. But both the Broncos and the Chargers disproved the theory as New York lost again. Come on, come on, turn around! <laughs> Against a Forest Green New England setting, the Jets next played Boston. Here, a change occurred. Namath had completed a record 29 passes against San Diego, but lost. Now he began to throw less and run more, especially against Boston's three-man line. Three Turner field goals and a strong pass rush were the difference, however, in the 23-14 victory. 
The ground game swung into high gear against Cincinnati, the Jets' fifth straight away game. Emerson Boozer had his best day ever, gaining 129 yards. The special teams also excelled in this victory over the Bengals, and the Jets returned home with a 3-2 and two record, the same record they had at this point last year. The hands of Babe Perilli, the accurate centers of John Schmidt, the educated toe of Jim Turner, three men who would often provide the margin of victory. The entire kicking game saw great improvement. Rookie punter Steve O'Neill, who led the league for much of the season, spiraled his way into New Yorkers' hearts with his towering punts. On the other end of punts and kickoffs was the Jets' brash and feisty rookie Mike Battle, who returns kicks like he was in another sport. In fact, youth played a prominent part on this year's team. Besides Battle and O'Neill, number 61, Roger Finney, started at offensive tackle, a feat in itself for a rookie. Second-year man Steve Thompson, number 85, was the regular defensive tackle for the first time and had an excellent year. Linebacker Paul Crane, number 56, began the year as a replacement for the injured Ralph Baker, but performed so well, he started for over half the season. Harvard's John Dockery, number 43, tied for the team's interception lead in his first year as a regular. The Jets' defense is young in spirit as well as experience. Dockery led a secondary that averages about four years per man. Along with Dockery, Cornell Gordon and Randy Beverly patrol the corners, while Bill Baird and sophomore Jim Richards were the deep men. In front of the secondary were a group of linebackers that performed with equal enthusiasm. From the aggressive pursuit of number 62, Captain Al Atkinson, to the search and destroy missions of number 51, Ralph Baker, to the inimitable tackling style of the veteran Larry Grantham, number 60. The Jet strong suit, though, was their front four, perhaps the youngest and quickest in the league. Jerry Philbin, number 81, was the bulwark of the line, a clever pass rusher who used speed and cunning more than brute strength to seek his prey. Philbin was again an all-league selection. At tackles were Steve Thompson and number 80, John Elliott, an all-league choice in only his third year and the quickest tackle in the league, according to his teammates. At right end was Verlin Biggs, number 86, who, like Grantham, had a special style of tackling that resembled calf roping at a rodeo. The nucleus of a champion is its defense. Coach Wee Bubank has built a solid one, one that took his team all the way in 1968. Though injury prone for much of the year, it was this defense that helped keep New York's title hopes alive until that cold day in December. While the defense was sometimes inconsistent, the Jets' offense was steady and effective, but fewer points were scored due to the heavy emphasis on the running game. Number 31, veteran Bill Mathis, had several clutch performances in a spot role. Emerson Boozer, number 32, seems to get better every year. Boozer has a very quick start and consistently is a dangerous trap-type runner who can make the abrupt cut once through the hole. Only in his third full season 
Boozer broke loose for over 600 yards and when in top physical form, is one of the best young runners in the game. Matt Snell's legacy is versatility. Number 41 is a fine receiver, a superb blocker, and a perfect passer, one for one. Snell is the ideal size setback, 6'2", 220 pounds, big enough to hurt when he hits, quick enough to slide by the linebackers on screen, fast enough to break away for long games. An all-league selection and team leader in rushing, Matt Snell does everything well. A textbook setback. But what about the men in front of the man? The mother hens of football, the offensive line. The Jets have one of the best. Number 67 is Dave Herman, an all-star for the last two years. Center John Schmidt, number 52, is another impeccable protector. Guard Randy Rasmussen, number 66, had his best year ever. Tackle Roger Finney, number 61, is just a rookie with a long career ahead. And number 75, Winston Hill, is a combined all-pro, the outstanding member of a quintet. The Jets' tight end, Pete Lamons, is both a bruising blocker and a hard-nosed receiver. He is the first of the Jets' trio of Texan pass catchers. Not as bruising as Lamons, but more devastating, is number 83, George Sauer. Sauer caught fewer passes this year, but had more touchdowns than ever before. One of every six passes Sauer caught was a touchdown, even though double teamed whenever possible. Country Don Maynard is infinitely wise after 12 years of run and catch in the pros. Maynard's appearance and his receiving style are that of a sly old fox. And the only thing that stopped him was a late season injury that may have cost him the title. Every yard and every catch Maynard made just added to his all-time total and moved him one step closer to the Hall of Fame. Then there was the guy who made it all work. The guy with the white shoes, shaggy hair, and golden arm. Joe threw the fewest times since his rookie year and led a controlled conservative offense in which he himself was seen courageously hobbling for the goal line or a key first down. Each time he dropped back, each time he released could have been his last, but Joe's spirit, his poise under pressure, are what the New York Jets are about. Even Namath's passing style reflects his contempt of danger, playing brinksmanship with onrushing linemen, until his bear trap release could find a receiver in the open. Aided by a line that allowed him to be dropped only 13 times, second fewest in Jet history, Namath hit on 19 touchdowns and finished second for the league passing title.
But Joe Willie Namath is no longer paid just for his arm. His true worth now lies in his gamesmanship and his inspired leadership. For it, he was voted the AFL's most valuable player for the second straight year. In fact, the name of charisma has reached mammoth proportions, often having more trouble leaving a game than winning it. Joe's talent and charisma helped lead the Jets through the critical second phase of their season. Houston began this second phase, a series of seven straight games at home. Though a black cat tried to spoil their home opener, the black shoe of Jim Turner could not be jinxed. Turner's four field goals, the combination of Joe Namath to Don Maynard, and a last quarter interception in the end zone by Al Atkinson were enough to defeat the Oilers 26 to 17 as the Jets took sole possession of first place with a four and two record. Against Boston, a key injury occurred when number 22, Jim Hudson was sidelined for the year and the Patriots led for much of the game. But Matt Snell's running brought the Jets back. Gaining over 100 yards on the day, Snell's touchdown and Jim Turner's field goals closed the gap. Then Emerson Boozer went over with nine minutes left, and the defense preserved the close call 23-17 victory over the Patriots. It took another come-from-behind surge to beat Miami. Riddle for four touchdowns by Bob Greasy. The Jets trailed 31 to 24 in the fourth quarter. But Namath hit Maynard, who spilled into the end zone to tie the game. Minutes later, John Elliott blocked a punt. Jim Turner would again be called on to salvage victory. Turner delivered, and the Jets won 34 to 31. Against Buffalo, the defense removed two quarterbacks and showed little sympathy for the other. The big play, however, was a miraculous left-footed punt by Steve O'Neill that saved the 16-6 triumph over the Bills. It was New York's sixth straight victory, a club record. Then the Kansas City Chiefs rolled into New York and rolled over the Jets 34-17 to break the streak. Otis Taylor devastated the secondary in a preview of what he had in store not only for the Jets, but for the NFL champion Vikings. But the Jets regrouped and against the Bengals played their best game of the season. The defense easily handled Greg Cook, demonstrating their ability to recover from a poor showing the week before. It was somewhat of a Pyrrhic victory, however, as Don Maynard was lost for the season. A championship team is a healthy team, and the Jets were being snake bitten by injury. They still gave the Bengals a 40 to seven shellacking in their 11th game. Against Oakland, mistakes and a matter of inches resulted in a 27 to 14 defeat before a league record audience. While a disappointed crowd went home, the Jets went to Houston and won their second Eastern Conference title. Thus it was that on a cold and windy December day, Hank Stram brought his variety show from Kansas City to New York, while Weeb Bank tried to squeeze one more victory out of the Jets. A season of hopes, a season of inches, to culminate in one hour of success or failure. From the opening kickoff, the game was dominated by the street-fighting, gang-tackling play of both defenses, in which neither team was able to score a touchdown for three quarters. As Hank Stram later said, it was like a game of checkers. Everybody was waiting for that one big move.
The Jets' move came midway through the final period. Trailing 6-3, to three, an interference call gave them a first and goal on the Chiefs' one. On first down, Namath sent Matt Snell into the guts of the Chiefs' great defense. He got half a yard. Then it was Bill Mathis. Up, but not over, said the officials. Knowing he would settle for a tying field goal on fourth down, Namath called a rollout option for that last half yard. The results will be vividly remembered for seasons to come. One play, one pass, had virtually ended the New York Jets' season. Now the Chiefs' offense, inspired by their defense's heroics, attacked with shocking suddenness. Dawson and Taylor correctly gauged the wind, and 61 yards later were on the Jets' 19. On the next play, the game's only touchdown was scored. One touchdown behind, New York had time and opportunity to at least tie the score. But pass after pass failed by inches to meet its mark. When Namath's final pass was intercepted in the end zone, the New York Jets' reign as world champions was over. But the Jets can look back with pride. They surrendered their crown to the new champions in a very even contest, ever so close to victory, ever so close to being the best. Though disappointed on the final day of a long season, the Jets will enter the decade of the 70s with a rich history behind them and a bright future ahead. The New York Jets will be number one again.